Tomorrow morning, when you wake up, a few sure things will happen. The sun will come up, we'll all be one day older, and the world will demand and consume around 95 million barrels of oil. The cycle will repeat itself the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. The population of the world is growing. That's the blue line you see on the graph, and those are years across the axis. And I want to bring your attention to the year 1970. In 1970, there was 3.7 billion people on the planet. And just think about that for a minute. Think of all the generations and all the millenniums it took to get to that number. And yet, in a mere 45 years, it's nearly doubled, and today there's 7.3 billion people on the planet. Well, that orange line on the graph, that's the demand of oil over that same amount of time. And you see those two trend nearly identically. And today, we're in that mid-90s for uh, how much the world demands oil. Developing nations are getting wealthier and wealthier, and wealth and energy consumption go hand in hand. And to this day, the most readily available and scalable forms of energy are fossil fuels, in particular, oil. So why have we gravitated to oil all this time? Well, it's reliable. It's a tried and true method of transportation that works without fail in planes, trains, buses, ships, cars, lawnmowers, and it makes for a great heating fuel. It's transportable. You can literally bring this stuff anywhere. You can't bring a jerry can of electrons anywhere, but you can with petroleum. It's scalable. We have a network of pipelines and and refineries and fueling stations all over the planet. This stuff is really easy to get access to. It's low cost, it's too low if you ask me, but... <laughs> and a, a few weeks ago, it was literally cheaper than a bucket of chicken. It's come up a bit, thankfully, here. But in all seriousness, for you could drive, with $50 of diesel, you could drive from Calgary to Vancouver in a vehicle with your family, with your kids, and be there for like 50 bucks. It's amazing value. And, oh yeah, you might not realize this, but there are over 6,000 other products made from petroleum waste byproducts. This list includes fertilizer, linoleum, perfume, toys, electronics, yes, your iPhone, soap, vitamin capsules, we use it to lubricate machinery, big and small, from printing presses to bicycles, to make the asphalt we use to pave our roads, to make medicines, ink, pesticides, paints, varnishes, the list goes on. So I'll ask the question, can we live the life we want without oil? Here's something else to think about. There are 93 nations in the world that produce oil. We're fifth on that list close to four and a half million barrels a day that Canada produces. We're practically tied with China for fourth. We are far beyond, well, Canada consumes a little over two million barrels a day, and like I said, we produce four and a half million barrels. The US, you see on there, produces close to 14 million barrels. So we're in the top five percentile of the planet when it comes to producing oil countries. And when it comes to recoverable reserves, we're third on that list. This is the amount of oil we have in the ground that's going to be, we're going to be able to extract in, in, in all the years in the future. 173 billion barrels. We have a lot of oil in Canada. Make no mistake, we are a heavyweight when it comes to the oil nations of the world. Well, when you produce a lot of oil, it generates a lot of money and a, and a lot. This table shows the average revenues to the Canadian government that come from the energy industry. This is the average from 2008 to 2012. So when you add all those things together, the taxes, the royalties, land sales, all that, it's $25 billion a year, billion with a B. It's a lot of money that comes in. How do you replace that? So we know a few things. We know we use oil a lot. Maybe you didn't realize how much we, we use it. We know it produces a lot of money for Canada today, and we know it'll produce a lot of money in the years to come. So what's the problem? Well, you know the problem. Oil industry is encumbered with environmental issues. And it has a lot of people suggesting we should rid the world of its dependence on oil. And that's a fair statement. But what if we could make the system better? 
what if we could innovate ways to overcome the environmental issues that surround the oil industry? I'm going to give you a few examples. And here's one as a result of raising the standards in, in, emission sta in our emission standards. And this is where I'm going with all this. When we raise our standards, that's when innovation and creativity are at their best. You're going to see this here. So this, this idea came out of McMaster University. And they said, hey, emission standards are going to increase by 40% over the next 10 years in North America. So we've got to get innovative. We've got to get creative. What are we going to do? Well, they came up with a, a new catalytic converter. That's a catalytic converter. Those have been mandatory on vehicles since 1975. It's really cool. What it does is it takes toxic pollutants from the engine, um, hydrocarbons, carbon oxide, nitrous oxides. They undergo an oxidization reaction within the catalytic converter, and the compounds that come out are water, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. It's beautiful. It's elegant engineering. It's brilliant. The problem with the catalytic converter is that it only works when an engine's at operating temperature. And so for the time you turn your key on to the time you reach operating temperatures, five to 10 minutes, maybe 10 minutes in a cold Canadian morning. Well, that's called cold start emissions. And research suggests that 80% of the pollutants from vehicles is as a result of cold start emissions. So this group, the engineering department out there, they said, hey, what if we got rid of that? How could we get rid of it? How could we superheat catalytic converter, and they got this idea, another technology that exists. It's an induction, same thing as an induction stove top. We have one of these in our house. You fill a pot of water, put it on the stove, and it literally heats in, in like 20 seconds. It'll be boiling water. It's amazing. It heats things at a torrent pace. This picture shows ice cubes. They're on the burner, but they don't melt. They have to be touching metal. So it uses magnetic energy to superheat things. And they said, hey, let's just put that in the catalytic converter. Get rid of that cold, practically get rid of that cold start emission window. That's brilliant. And how'd that happen? We just raise the standards, say, hey, we got to think, think beyond this. Think higher than this. Here's another example. A lot of innovation, we've used a lot of innovation to unlock oil reserves. This is a picture from Huntington Beach, California in 1960. You would never do this today. Look at that, all these uh, oil derricks along the beach. But the point I'm trying to make here is you see how we used to think of developing oil pools where you would drill a bunch of vertical wells. And innovation and technologies brought us past that. Now we drill horizontally. It's the equivalent of drilling a whole bunch of vertical wells. And we also have unlocked another technology and tried this other innovation called hydraulic fracturing, which has revolutionized the oil industry. It's worth noting that the USA was supposed to run out of oil in the 1960s. Fast forward 50 years. And they were at the top of that list. Remember, they were the biggest oil producing nation on the planet. These two innovations changed everything for them. Well, here's another example. That's, that's a puck of bitumen. That's oil. It doesn't flow, though, very well at all. And some creative and innovative people got together and thought, hey, what if we, what if we could change the viscosity of that when it's in the ground? We could actually make it flow. So it's called steam-assisted gravity drainage. And you put steam in one well bore, changes the viscosity of that oil so it's able to flow and then you're able to pump it out. This has unlocked a ton of oil in Canada for us. Here's, a, here's another idea and this is tied to low emission, uh, low emission zones. So you might have heard about these. These are popping up in Europe. They're in, I think it's close to 200 cities in nine different EU countries right now. And they're low emission zones. So you, essentially you can't drive through them if your vehicle isn't deemed a low emission vehicle. And you see how this is going to be changing, and, and there'll be more of these. And you see how this will impact the car manufacturers in the years to come. So knowing that we're going that way, that's a good thing, right? We're raising the standards. That's going to force innovation. And when you think about it, maybe it'll force us to even rethink how, we, how the automobile has been developed. Because for 100, well, over 100 years, from 1904 till, till now, one thing's always stayed consistent. Automobiles vent to the atmosphere. I just wonder if we rethought the internal combustion engine. What if we had a way of, of capturing, capturing those emissions? You'd maybe starting, like starting from the end in mind. So you say, well, we're going to put fuel in, we're going to contain and capture all the emissions, and maybe we dispose of them at the same time we get more fuel. Kind of like when you go to put water in your RV or trailer. You know, you 
put your fresh water in and get rid of the gray water at fueling stations. And, and, and you say, well, well, what would you do with all that carbon dioxide? Well, we use, it. we use it. This is good stuff in the oil industry. We use it to inject into the earth. It actually allows us to enhance the oil recovery in the oil reservoirs that we have. What a cool cycle, hey, to pull, pull the resource out, consume the energy, put the waste pride product back in, and you're able to get more oil out. That's pretty cool. It'll be neat to see how the future unfolds. I do believe that innovation will allow us to overcome, to overcome these environmental issues that face the oil industry. I want to encourage you guys. Like, create, creativity is thinking up new things, and innovation is doing new things, and, and we've got we to gotta get there. All you kids, we've got to get there. I really like what Albert Einstein said. He said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to the, create them. So again, I want to encourage all the innovators of today and all the innovators of tomorrow, especially you kids, you young adults and kids out there, to think, to really think. Before you jump from one idea to another, think, how can this be made better? I said it before, innovation and creativity are at their best when we raise our standards. So I'll leave you with this. Let's, collectively, let's raise ourselves to a higher standard. Always, always give your best. And let's make the system better.